The Nightmare Before Christmas is an exceptionally odd film. A stop-motion, animated musical that seeks to blend the haunting imagery of Halloween with the whimsical magic of Christmas, to spin the tale of someone who longs for something new and exciting beyond the world that they know. There's a lot going on here, and there certainly was the potential for these elements to not gel, but God, it's, it's just such a fun movie. From the fantastic designs and lovable characters, to the impeccable stop-motion animation, to the insanely catchy soundtrack, it's this triumph of a film that shows how all these zany variables can mix and mingle to produce a charming piece of art that can touch anyone. Thanks to the help of multiple re-releases and every hot topic around the country, The Nightmare Before Christmas has garnered a massive cult following to the point where its world, characters, and music have become a part of Halloween's larger ensemble of iconography. Just the other day, I was turning onto my street when I saw a house decorated with Oogie Boogie, Jack Skellington, and Sally on the front porch. When considering where the film started, it's kind of crazy to think how far it's come. The idea for The Nightmare Before Christmas actually started as a poem written by Tim Burton back in 1982, drawing inspiration from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Although some key elements in the film like Sally and Oogie Boogie were nowhere to be seen, the core narrative of Jack Skellington longing for something new in life and stealing Christmas for himself holds true. If you're interested, there's actually an adaptation of the poem that you can find on YouTube that's narrated by the legend Christopher Lee. Burden considered having it turned into a television special, or a children's book, but after showing some of his storyboards and concept art to Disney animator Henry Selick, it seems like maybe Disney could turn this into something, even if it was an animated special. However, The Nightmare Before Christmas was deemed too weird for Disney to take the risk, and eventually, Burden was fired in 1984. After making a bigger name for himself in the industry with the success of 1988's Beetlejuice and 1989's Batman, Disney was now far more interested in Burden, who had not forgotten about his original project all those years ago. Except, also, not interested enough, because they released it under their subsidiary brand, Touchstone Pictures, as, according to Selleck himself, they thought it could damage the brand. Yeah, Disney kinda treated the IP pretty terribly until they realized they could make something from it. Regardless, Selleck and he decided to bring The Nightmare Before Christmas to life in the form of a stop-motion animated film, and began the long, arduous production in July 1991. Finally, in October 1993, 30 years ago, The Nightmare Before Christmas was released. But this is where it gets interesting. Somewhere amidst the sea of re-releases and Hot Topic merch, some brave soul stood tall and asked, but what if we made it a video game? to which they were met with thunderous applause and the promise of not just one game based on the IP, but two. The Nightmare Before Christmas, The Pumpkin King, and Oogie's Revenge. These two games have a bit of a strange relationship, coming out here in North America on the same day, October 10th, 2005, for the Game Boy Advance and Xbox as well as the PS2, respectively. Although I wanted the console title Oogie's Revenge after seeing it at a friend's house, I didn't have either of those systems to play it, so my parents were kind enough to get me the Game Boy Advance title, The Pumpkin King, that I didn't even know existed until I unwrapped it. Hey, thanks mom and dad! Okay, so what kind of games are they then? Perhaps a platformer? Maybe an action game? Actually, a rhythm game would make a lot of sense as a musical. Well, what if I told you that the Game Boy Advance one was a Metroidvania, and the PS2 and Xbox One was a DMC character action game. And also a prequel and a sequel to the movie, but you know, small details. It's such a strange notion to wrap your head around initially. Genres aside, just the fact that they went the route of using the games to continue the stories. I actually love that idea, and wouldn't mind more cross-series ventures doing this. What's even more is that, while not officially confirmed by Disney from what I could find, these were considered canon by the fanbase for the longest time, until the release of the novel Long Live the Pumpkin Queen in 2022, which clashed with the game's narrative. Even just forgetting the canonical status, making Jack into a Belmont and Dante from Devil May Cry sounds like one hell of a fever dream, but it actually makes a lot of sense. The Nightmare Before Christmas's spooky imagery and world design matches exceptionally well with both Castlevania and Devil May Cry, who are practically responsible for creating their respective genres. Yet, this is all just scratching the surface, so to cap off this October, we're going to be visiting Halloween Town to cover all things related to the Nightmare Before Christmas video games. 
This goes without saying, but this video will contain spoilers for both the film and the game, so be warned. With that out of the way, if you haven't wondered what these games were about, I'd say it's time you begun. Before diving into the main event, there is technically one other video game that is built on The Nightmare Before Christmas. A humble little flash game called Jack's Sleigh Ride, which was released for an app and website called Disney LOL. This app was taken down in 2018, but the flash game can still be played if you look around for it. Honestly, the game is pretty simple. Control Jack using the mouse to fly over the houses, grabbing candy, and click the mouse to deliver gifts to rack up your points, while avoiding this tank who does not play around like this dude hates Christmas. The one catch is that you'll get a preview of what color present you have in your sack, and you have to drop it on houses that match that color. If you hit a string of, say, three purple houses with a purple gift, you'll get all of them, as well as a point bonus to boot. You can build up combos by hitting your marks, which is way easier than you'd think because the hitboxes are super forgiving. Honestly, it's probably just easier to spam the presents because look at this! As you advance through the levels, different colored houses get added to the mix, and some of them... shoot... balloons? According to the tutorial page, they're toxic gases, but why in God's name do these households have toxic gases ready to shoot up their chimneys at a moment's notice? This flash game doesn't run that smoothly, so you can take some cheap hits. Once your health bar is depleted, it's game over. Damn, well, okay. You know, I, I guess 80,000 really ain't that bad. Is this the... Oh, oh my, oh. <laughs> that's the cut? That is the most perfect cut I could possibly imagine. But yeah, that's Jack Sleigh Ride. With that detour over, let's take a closer look at the first of the two main titles, Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, The Pumpkin King. The box art is actually pretty clean and has a sick lenticular cover just like Majora's Mass's cartridge, so already a strong first impression. This game was released for the Game Boy Advance and developed by Tosei, a Japanese company that's worked on a handful of earlier Dragon Ball titles, assisted with several intelligence system properties, and even shares the copyright for the legendary Starfy with Nintendo. On the publisher side in most territories was Disney Interactive Studios, a company that unfortunately shut down in 2016 alongside the discontinuation of Disney Infinity, which Jack Skellington was also in. Originally, I planned to cover every single video game that featured The Nightmare Before Christmas in it. Until I realized how insane that sounded. Anyways, The Pumpkin King hit store shelves in Japan on September 8th, 2005, in the US about a month later on October 10th, and finally Europe on November 10th, which just feels wrong. There's something tragic about the Halloween-themed video game coming out more than a week after the actual holiday. And to those that want to make the argument that The Nightmare Before Christmas is a Christmas movie, so November is a fine release date, that doesn't work here, because there is no Christmas to be found in this game. The Pumpkin King serves as a prequel to the events of the 1993 film, meaning Jack hasn't discovered Christmastown yet, nor has he met Sally or Oogie Boogie officially. Let's cover a brief synopsis of the prequel's narrative. Years prior to the events of the film, Jack Skellington, still optimistic and not yet disenchanted by the monotonous routine, prepares for the annual Halloween celebration, where he plans to debut his newest trick, the Pumpkin King Transformation. Meanwhile, local brats Locke, Shock, and Barrel tell their boss Oogie Boogie about Jack, and how he's the scariest guy around. With his pride wounded and the desire to be the only king in Halloween Town, Oogie sends the three to capture and bring Jack to him. However, in a similar fashion to the film, the miscreants capture the wrong person initially, this time being Dr. Finkelstein's new assistant, Sally. Enraged, Oogie sends his army of bugs to plague Halloween Town and ruin the festivities. Jack then sets out to the far corners of Halloween Town in order to save his scattered and troubled friends, and stop Oogie Boogie so that Halloween may be saved in time. It's an incredibly simple setup, with the only other real plot development outside of brief conversations with the citizens of Halloween Town coming at the game's finale, which I think is perfectly fine, especially when considering the genre this title falls under. As mentioned previously, The Pumpkin King is a Metroidvania-style game, where the player must navigate through a wide assortment of areas to find upgrades, abilities, and new routes that become accessible via those very abilities. It's that sense of discovery, mystery, and rewarding the player for remembering previous landmarks and areas that has led to the genre gaining mass appeal. Titles like Super Metroid and Castlevania Symphony of the Night that have defined the genre are consistently praised for the very nature of their construction, 
giving the player a sense of the world and controls before organically opening it up for a large-scale exploration, all while not making the player feel limited in those early sections. Okay, so, eight years after Symphony of the Night redefined the genre, how does the Pumpkin King fare and manage to make a name for itself? Well, it really doesn't do anything in particular to stand out, but it still fares perfectly fine. Over the course of the adventure, you will travel to a number of locations from the film, such as Jack's house, Dr. Finkelstein's lab, the Pumpkin Patch, and Ogie Slayer, all of which will have the player returning to them at some point to explore a section tucked deeper in the labyrinth of rooms and unlocked with a new ability. There's nothing in here that had me particularly captivated or felt like the abilities were being used in exceptionally creative ways beyond their general use, but the game did do a rather good job of varying traversal through certain sections. For example, a section in the graveyard takes advantage of these bells to make material platforms to use for progression, while the pumpkin patch utilizes these mushrooms as cover for a stealth segment of sorts. Not Every one of these ideas was a hit, as I wasn't necessarily fond of these mosquito bastards, but I wouldn't say any were offensive, and I respect the idea of varying these regions not just by their visual appearance, but by the means of progression and enemy variety. I only found myself frustrated with the level design at two intervals, which were not necessary for the main story and just involved leaps of faith with incredibly strict timing that would punish you by having you cycle through several screens and potentially resources just for another attempt. Exploration is also pretty straightforward, with some areas needing a power-up or using simple coded blocks to indicate the necessary upgrade, similarly to Metroid's speed booster and missile blocks. The biggest criticism I have with regards to this game's exploration is the lack of agency given to the player. While some Metroidvanias may use indicators to guide the player initially, or subtle ones throughout the duration of the game to at least hint at a general direction, the Pumpkin King ubiquitously plants signs with red arrows that scream, Hey buddy, you should go that way. I understand that this game may have been designed with a younger audience in mind who might need that guidance, but it heavily strips away those pillars of discovery and agency that support the genre. Since the main path is laid out rather plainly, exploration is finite and primarily tied to upgrades for your health in the form of shrunken heads or collectible items. As far as I'm aware, these collectibles do absolutely nothing, and while I got a lot, I didn't get all of them and never felt compelled to do so. I believe that a reward for these pickups or more kit-altering items would have helped to reward players' curiosity and skill. Speaking of Jack's kit, Behind every good Metroidvania is a fun and varied arsenal that feels satisfying to use and offers new methods of tackling situations. Jack's utility belt consists of the frog gun, the bat meringue, pumpkin bombs, and the elixir that allows him to temporarily turn into the Pumpkin King. It's not the most revolutionary ensemble of tools, but it covers enough ranges and general uses that it does its job. As Jack progresses, he'll also get enhanced versions of each weapon from bigger bombs to a buff-ass frog that just socks enemies in the jaw. Boss fights may take a second or two to figure out the appropriate part to hit, and some did come down to the wire, but they're rather self-explanatory. I do love the variants in designs, with some being entirely unique, like most of Ogie's bugs, while others draw inspiration from the film, like this snake in the laboratory. But before moving to the conclusion, let's touch on the visuals and music. These are the categories that I feel this game succeeds in the most. The sprite work is actually pretty impressive for the Game Boy Advance, and there are some fun animations here, especially with Jack's movement. One of the things that I've always loved about the Nightmare Before Christmas characters, especially Jack Skellington, is how it feels to be a perfect marriage between the medium of stop-motion animation and just being incredibly satisfying and interesting designs. Jack's tall, thin build and limber nature combine to create some very fascinating movement that translates exceptionally well to stop motion, and they do a good job carrying it over to the game. Like, every single time you defeat a boss, Jack does this epic dance to a musical number, and it's the goofiest thing ever, but I always look forward to it every time. Each of the locations also has its own stylistic flair that separates them from one another, alongside their unique gimmicks. There are a lot of references to the movie tucked away in this game, and as a longtime fan of the movie, it does feel like the developers did research and cared for the IP. On the audio side of things, I've heard some people mention that the music can be grating on the ears, which I can understand as a criticism when the entire soundtrack takes inspiration from the films, and those would be the definitive versions of these songs, but I don't think they're that bad either. 
The only real issue is that the loops are rather short, giving them the ability to get old real fast in a game of this style. That last song in particular comes from Oogie's Lair, which is the destination for this game's finale. After battling through the swarms of bugs, the mayor informs Jack of Oogie Boogie, which sets him on the path to stop him, as well as Locke, Shock, and Barrel, who give you the runaround through his lair. Finally, after tracking down the trio, the passage opens to the final encounter with Oogie Boogie, which is split into two phases. Phase 1 is similar to the film's finale, with Jack and Oogie becoming entangled in a dance as he avoids numerous traps on Oogie's roulette wheel of death. Once Oogie rolls his dice to determine the attack he will use, he becomes tuckered out, leaving open a window of vulnerability. Once defeated, you'll get your victory dance, Oogie will call Jack a pumpkin pussy. Wait, excuse me, what did he just say? After that, it's on to the final phase, where Oogie and his cronies will ride around on a large bug. This is by far the toughest fight in the game, but it's primarily because he has this sequence where he becomes completely invulnerable and it lasts forever. If you spam pumpkin bombs, it'll take you far, but man, did I cut it close with all my reckless damage boosting. Following the fight, Jack threatens Oogie to never cross him again gets introduced to Sally in an extremely brief fashion, and finally celebrates Halloween with all of his friends, rolling the credits on the prequel story. The game took me close to six hours to beat while collecting most of the extras, so it's not a long game at all, and could be pumped out in an afternoon or two. Really, the last thing I've mentioned with this game are the minigames. Over the course of the story, you'll corner Locke, Shock, and Barrel, who will then give Jack a minigame as a present, usually serving as a pretty effective distraction. I never thought that a meta element would be worked into the progression of a Nightmare Before Christmas story, but here we are. I find it rather strange that these are collected over the course of the main game, since these sorts of side distractions are normally unlocked via collectibles or via exploration. Honestly, these would have been perfect rewards for collecting the pickups, which might have incentivized players to actually want to find them all. That is what I would say if these minigames weren't painfully mediocre and just really unfun. Bonebreaker is a button masher alternating between the left and right d-pad buttons. Whackhammer involved swinging the correct hammer on bats or rats while avoiding bombs that pass on the conveyor belt. And Skullduggery is just that memory game roll out the barrels from Mario Party 2, except it greatly overstays its welcome. These really did not have to be included in this game. But to my complete dismay, these minigames support multiplayer via the link cable. To which I ask, who the hell is calling up three of their friends for a riveting game session of Bonebreaker from Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas The Pumpkin King for the Game Boy Advance? All in all, The Pumpkin King is a perfectly fine video game. The gameplay is alright, the music works, and the animations and art are actually pretty good. If you're looking for the next Super Metroid or Hollow Knight on your hunt for more Metroidvanias, I don't think this will satisfy you, but if you're a fan of The Nightmare Before Christmas, yeah, it might be worth checking out. It's certainly not revolutionary, but it doesn't feel like a shoehorned licensed game either, and there are enough references and love for the series that warrant its existence. Closing out our package deal is the sister title to The Pumpkin King, Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, Oogie's Revenge. I always found this art of Jack on the cover to be kind of strange, like why does his skull look so crinkly and rugged here? Released on the same day as The Pumpkin King, Oogie's Revenge served as the counterpart for those that possessed a PS2 or Xbox, wanted their fill of The Nightmare Before Christmas, and needed more Devil May Cry in their lives, since the game uses that series as the main inspiration for its gameplay, and came out the same year that Devil May Cry 3 released. That is a very bold strategy. All right, I need to know who the hell worked on the Capcom? There's actually no way. Can I even call this a Devil May Cry ripoff when the bloody developers themselves worked on it? They could have just taken the sticker from Shin Megami Tensei Free Nocturne and slapped it on this. Much like how the Pumpkin King sought to extend the overall narrative with an origin story for Jack's encounter with Oogie Boogie, Oogie's Revenge serves the role of a sequel to the film. After another successful Halloween, Jack feels discouraged that something more could be done, 
and ventures off into the unknown in the search for something new and exciting. It's practically the same setup as the film, except this time Jack is equipped with Dr. Finkelstein's newest invention, the Soul Robber, which is essentially just one of those sticky hand things you get in a goodie bag and smack your friends with for a couple seconds. However, Jack's departure opens the window of opportunity for Locke, Shock, and Barrel to resurrect Oogie Boogie. The idea of resurrecting Oogie is kind of weird to think about, since he's a collection of bugs. Do each of those bugs contain a piece of Oogie Boogie like Exodia, or is it like a Halo Gravemind where a certain number of bugs put together form an Oogie consciousness? Maybe it's just like making a snowman, but with bugs. Either way, Oogie has taken control of Halloween Town by deceiving, capturing, or incapacitating its numerous citizens, and using the newly brainwashed Dr. Finkelstein as a mouthpiece for making a dangerous Halloween to please Jack. After returning to a ghost town and encountering Oogie's shadow, Jack once again sets out to foil Oogie's schemes and save his friends. Very much like the Pumpkin King, the setup is rather simple, and I think I prefer that for a game based on the film. The narrative does become a bit more ambitious, however, as a little over halfway through the game, it's revealed that Oogie's plans extend beyond ruling Halloween Town, but capturing the leaders of the other holidays and becoming the Seven Holidays King. The holidays are Halloween Town and Christmas Town, of course. Easter Town, Valentine's Day Town, Thanksgiving Town, that's just an all-you-can-eat buffet, St. Patrick's Day Town, and Independence Day Town. Okay, hold up. I have so many questions. First off, who are the leaders of some of these towns? Like, we know Jack is the leader of Halloween Town, Santa for Christmas, the Easter Bunny for Easter, and... I guess Cupid and St. Patrick are safe guesses for Valentine's Day Town and St. Patrick's Day Town respectively, but who runs Thanksgiving Town? Christopher Columbus? Because, oh boy, that's uh, y you know what, I I'm just gonna say it's a giant turkey. But then we're left with the most confusing of all. What the heck is an Independence Day Town? Is this just America perpetually stuck in the year 1776 and... If so, does that make the leader commander-in-chief of the Continental Army George Washington? Or wait, the, the real world is actually shown to be a part of the Nightmare Before Christmas universe, meaning the leader likely has changed over time. Okay, so this game came out in 2005, which means that the leader and the one in the sack would be... George W. Bush? You know, this is a rabbit hole that I do not think I want to continue in. Questions of patriotism aside, one of the most alluring components to this game is the emphasis on trying to make it feel like a legitimate continuation from the movie. Oki's Revenge looks to bring back as much as the original voice cast as possible, and while they weren't able to bring everyone back, they managed to do an impressive job with two of the most important pieces being Christopher Sarandon as Jack Skellington and Ken Page as Oki Boogie. Ken Page is spectacular in this role, and still brings that same energy that makes the character so lovable. Jake. Sarandon is in a strange situation because the voice of Jack Skellington in the film was divided between two people. Danny Elfman, who acted as the singing voice for Jack, and Sarandon, who handled the speaking voice. Here, Sarandon is responsible for both parts because... Yes, this game has a lot of lyrical tracks that all remix songs from the film. Sarandon does a pretty good job with the songs, but there are a couple lines that feel a bit stilted or low on energy. It's over! It's over! This time you've gone too far! It's over! I'm... The other voice actors, I feel, do a stellar job of following their predecessors. And the replacement actors would take on all of the original's roles, like with Kaf Susie, who replaces Catherine O'Hara for Sally and Shock. The new renditions of familiar songs are also excellent and fun alternatives to the original melodies. For example, What's This in the film embodies a whimsical, energetic tone as Jack is bombarded with emotions and excitement. But the remix from the game, Oh No, drops to a minor key to give it a more menacing, anxious feeling as Jack rushes to stop Oogie's destruction of Christmastown. Even Sally's song is morphed from a slow song concerned with unrequited love to a fast-paced battle tune as you take down a giant spider. Certainly not the direction I would have expected, but it works out. As long as you don't grow old of the battle theme being This Is Halloween, it's a pretty strong soundtrack, and I especially like the songs used for the Hinterlands and the final boss battle. More on that later. I recommend finding the soundtrack and giving it a listen. 
Truthfully, my main criticism for Ogi's Revenge is the gameplay itself. The style matches what I'd expect from the series, the remixes are excellent, and the graphics are pretty solid. But Jack feels pretty limited. With his Soul Robber, Jack has a default attack and a grab. The default attack can be charged or used in conjunction with a spin of the control stick to become an AoE defensive maneuver, and the grab can be converted into repeated slams or a throw, but that's about the extent of his offensive options. There's a taunt too, and aside from that, uh, he has a dodge with some neat animations? Jack is shallower than the likes of other character action stars, such as Bayonetta, Kratos, or later forms of Dante. I've actually heard that the game is pretty similar to Devil May Cry 1 in this regard. There are also the different stance changes unlocked over the story for use either mid-combat or for bypassing some obstacles like boarded up doors, or this asshole, which, oh, we'll get to him. The two forms available are the Pumpkin King and Santa Jack, with the former giving Jack a slow fire breath attack and a burst option that's extremely useful at the cost of resource management. And the latter form utilizes multi-purpose traps in the form of gifts like poison, stun, or freeze presence. Truthfully, I barely use these forms unless it was necessary since enemies can enter an aggro state where they are powered up, but can be removed by stunning them with Santa Jack's gifts. But I feel that most of the average playthrough is going to be default Jack, since the Soul Robber is by far the most reliable, powerful, and fun weapon to use in his kit, especially after purchasing several upgrades in the shop that give you combo finishers. One problem that feeds into my criticism of the gameplay is the lack of enemy variety. With a property as creative and weird as the Nightmare Before Christmas, they could have created some really unique enemy types, but most of the common enemies you fight in this game are either ghosts based on the introduction to This Is Halloween, or some variant of skeleton inspired by those ones you find in Ogie Slayer. There are different tiers of skeletons and ghosts as you advance through the game, but it did feel a bit uninspired. And man, groups of them would sometimes combo the hell out of me if I made a wrong move. Maybe they're just pissed about all those late night sessions of Bone Breaker with the boys. So, the gameplay is middling. But there is one trick it has up its sleeve that sets it apart. Ready? Three, two, one, let's get So yeah, if it wasn't strange enough to give the Nightmare Before Christmas game the gameplay of Devil May Cry, it transforms into a hybrid rhythm game with major boss fights. This is awesome. It feels perfectly on brand for the series and captures the whimsical nature of the movie that makes it so special. I really wish the game found a way to work this mechanic into its identity more because it would make it far more unique and fascinating. As I mentioned, in terms of the story's progression, you'll find yourself moving through a number of locations from the film, such as the graveyard, Oogie's Lair, Halloween Town, and so on and so forth. However, unlike the Pumpkin King, which is one seamless experience, Ogi's Revenge is divided into chapters, with usually these chapters being contained within a single area. For example, Chapter 22 is primarily contained to one section of Christmas Town. And yes, Christmas Town actually is in this game, unlike in the Pumpkin King. However, it really is only in here for two chapters. If you're looking to get more of your Christmas fix playing a Nightmare Before Christmas title, you're better off just playing Kingdom Hearts 2 since that has the most fleshed out version of that world. In total, there are 24 main chapters in the game and several unlockable side chapters that you can discover. Throughout these chapters, you'll have a main goal to accomplish and along the way you'll fight a number of enemies that can give you credits to purchase items or upgrades from the shop, as well as find collectibles and other upgrades such as these golden pumpkins that extend your health bar or these trophies that you can find in the gallery in Jack's house. Because this game is divided into chapters just like any other character action game, this game has a ranking system. Completing chapters quickly, taking a minimal amount of hits, and spooking enemies will give you a higher score. If you score an A in all categories, you'll be rewarded with a figure that is added to your collection, and this can be used to unlock other items, such as music or extra costumes for Jack. Additionally, this game has a combo system, and it feels much more lenient than a title like Bayonetta. You can keep a combo even after getting hit, and sometimes you can get pretty long combos. Oh, 
I especially love the way the narrator delivers the lines because it's as if they're trying to be spooky, but epic at the same time. But regarding progression, sometimes this game could be rather unclear. You can click on the map to get a sense of direction on where to go sometimes, but that's not always the biggest help. The biggest roadblock that I faced was with this asshole right here, the clown with the tearaway face. See, Oogie has strapped a rocket to his unicycle, which means that he cannot stop and he is continually crying for help. Somebody stop me! You could try hitting him, you could try grabbing him, but nothing really works. You're not gonna make any progress. That is until you learn you can stun him with Santa Jack's gif. The jets kick back in shortly after, so what you have to do is head over to Dr. Finkelstein's lab to grab the bone driver tool to stop him. The game is really unclear about this. There's some language that hints at needing a tool, but this process of having to stop him with a gift, realizing it doesn't work so you have to go get a tool, and coming back to do it again is the most confusing thing in the game by far, and the exact same thing that stumped my friend and me as a kid. When I was younger and went over to my friend's house to play this game, we got stuck on this chapter for hours. We had no idea what to do with this jack wagon until my friend learned that you have to go get the driver and use it in the menu, and it's pretty precise too. Admittedly, I got stuck in this game more than the Metroidvania, which is horribly ironic because a Metroidvania is all about exploration and finding new paths, and this one had more times where the path felt most unclear. That being said, the visual flair in this game really helps to flesh out a lot of these environments. Like the Halloween Town Plaza and Oogie's Lair are very interesting, and I'd love to see more of these locations. On that note, let's jump to the filthy finale. After thwarting Oogie's attempts to murder Santa with a train, yes you heard that right, Oogie flies away on a sleigh only to plummet to the earth. Enraged and refusing to give up, Oogie summons an army of bugs to transform into a fucking kaiju, kicking off the two-phase final boss. The first phase simply requires Jack to light Oogie up using these open vents and isn't exactly noteworthy. However, the second phase might be my favorite thing in this entire game. Two of the best factors this game has going for it are the interactions between Jack and Oogie, as well as the musical numbers, particularly those that make use of the rhythm mechanics. So, what if we had a musical final boss battle between these rivals set to a remix of Oogie Boogie's theme? Yeah, it's… it's pretty awesome, and makes me wish that this mechanic was worked into this game's identity even more. After Oogie's defeat, Halloween Town is saved and Jack and Sally share one more moment together atop the spiral hill and beneath the moon, rolling the credits on Oogie's revenge. The sequel story took me a bit longer than the prequel, coming in around 9 hours and, while I do think I appreciate the concept of a Metroidvania based on the Nightmare Before Christmas more, Oogie's Revenge has more going for it with its music, voice acting, and more interesting narrative. Just like The Pumpkin King, it's not remarkable by any means, but it's charming enough and I'd honestly love to hear whether Devil May Cry fans prefer this game or Devil May Cry 2 since I hear a lot of conflicting thoughts about that game. The people that worked on this game did seem to have an adoration for the franchise. According to production manager Masato Yoshino, he went into the meeting with Tim Burton with the attitude that he was the biggest fan of The Nightmare Before Christmas, and he wanted to prove himself. While I don't think that Oogie's Revenge is a masterpiece by any stretch of the imagination, I do think it's a solid game that I'm both happy I played and exists. The same goes for The Pumpkin King. Well, just in time for Halloween, these are the three main games based on The Nightmare Before Christmas. Plenty of other games that feature its iconography and characters exist like Disney Infinity or a slew of mobile games, but they're supplementary for the most part. Although I wouldn't consider any of these games to be masterpieces, hell, I'd probably just call Jack Slay right bad, I think they have enough charming qualities and passion behind them to warrant their existence. And although I tried to look at the Pumpkin King with a critical eye, I do have a lot of nostalgic attachment to this game, and I have fond memories with it. If you're a fan of The Nightmare Before Christmas, it might be worth checking them out. And on that note, I'm packing it up. I'm going trick-or-treating. I've been looking at these for a month. I don't want to look at any other games featuring The Nightmare Before Christmas.
Hello everyone, thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this video. This idea has been a long time coming, I've wanted to do this for years covering these games, and you know, like I said in the video, it became pretty ambitious at first, I ended up getting Disney Infinity and like all the tools and stuff necessary for that until I realized I need to scale it back, but I'm pretty happy with how the video turned out and I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you did and would like to see more content like this or other video game story analyses, feel free to leave a like and subscribe to the channel as it helps out a lot and you'll be notified when new videos come out. If my voice sounds a bit off in this video, I'd like to apologize for that. I have been sick for about two weeks. I, I'm through the worst of it at this point, it's just that low energy in my my energy is is coming back it's just that my voice is a little off but unfortunately i did not have the luxury of time and i couldn't wait for it to get fully healed so i had to go with this so like i said i apologize and hopefully it's not too distracting regardless on that note thank you all again so much for watching this video i hope you have a wonderful halloween and until next time